Section 22 of A Budget of Christmas Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Song of the Star by Reverend C. H. Mead. Oh, boys, you can count me out on that. All I can get goes to my mother and sisters for Christmas. The speaker was a manly little newsboy, with good features, a clean face, and bright eyes. His clothes looked neat, though they were adorned with numerous patches. But see here, Will, Christmas only comes once a year, and why shouldn't we fellers have our banquet as well as the silk stockings? What would they know about things going on in the world anyway, if we newsboys didn't supply em with papers? All in favor of having a banquet, hold up your hands. Up went a score of hands, some dirty, some clean, and some speckled, but Will's hand remained down. See here, Will, what's the reason you won't stay by us? The boy hesitated a moment and then said, Boys, it's mighty close times up at our house. Fried chicken and pound cake don't come our way. Turkeys roost too high for us. And, well, boys, if you must know it, about the only good thing we kids have up there is our mother's love. See these patches? My mother put them on. See these stockings? My mother has been mending this same pair of stockings for more than a year, and she washes and irons them after I've gone to bed at night. Every stitch of mother's needle and thread is a stitch of love, and one night not long ago I opened my eyes and saw my mother's tears dropping on the sleeve of my coat at the same time she was putting the patch on this elbow. I tell you, boys, the best thing I've got in the world is my mother, and the best Christmas gift I ever had is my mother's love. If I had a million dollars, I'd give them all to my mother in return for her love. No, no, boys, no banquet for me, as long as I know my mother is starving herself, that we children may have more to eat. Well, replied one of the boys, if I had a mother like that, maybe I'd feel the same way. But all we get at our house is a good licking from a drunken mother, and I'm going in for a square meal at Christmas if I never has another. The boys, gathered on the sidewalk by one of the parks, were suddenly startled by a cry. Look out there! And the next moment, a runaway horse dashed into their midst. Little Will was knocked over and was soon carried into a neighboring drug store, all unconscious of what had happened. It was soon discovered that his arm was broken, and his body bruised in a number of places. The moment he regained consciousness and found what had occurred, he said, Take me to my mother. She will take care of me somehow, though this isn't exactly the kind of a Christmas gift I meant she should have. Say, boys, when if you go up to our house, and tell her easy about this, don't burst in sudden and scare her, but tell her it isn't dangerous, and, well, just tell her I love her. The boys wiped their eyes, and one of them said, Well, this busts up our banquet, fellers. I'll go and tell Will's mother, and say, fellers, shan't I tell her we will give our banquet money to help her out at Christmas? A hearty, You bet we will was the response, as Big Tom sped away to carry the news to Will's mother, while kind hands helped carry the injured boy to his home. It was a poor home into which he was born, but everything was as neat and tidy as could be. A woman stood at the door, and it needed but one glance to know that she was the mother of Will. Poverty and hunger had failed to rob her of her beauty and there was an air of refinement about her that told of better days and happier surroundings. 
Christmas hasn't come yet, mother, said Will, but I have. Don't you worry. I'll come out of this all right, and we will have a good Christmas yet. The mother kissed him tenderly as she said, No, I will not worry, so long as I have God, and you, and Josie, and Maggie, and Tot. When Christmas comes round, Will, it will be a good day, whatever it brings. It will bring your heaps of things, Mrs. Sandford, blurted out Big Tom, for we fellers has given up having a banquet, and are going to give yer something that Will can't bring now. Don't yer weary a bit. And here the rough fellow burst into tears, and rushed out of the house. A few more days, and then Christmas Eve came round, and a bright night it was. Will lay sleeping on the bed, his mother nearby, pretending to read, but in reality using the dear old Bible as a shield to hide the tears that trickled down her cheeks. The mother was thinking, and thinking fast, too. It was only a little over thirteen years since her father had closed the door in her face and told her never to return. The man she loved was not the fashionable fop her father had selected for her as a husband, and secretly she had given her hand to the man to whom long before she had given her heart. All went well until three years ago, when her husband died suddenly, and she found herself with no means and four children to take care of. Too proud to apply to her father for help, she struggled on as best she could, leaning hard on the God whom her mother had taught her to love. Her children were a comfort to her, for they had inherited the natural goodness of both their parents. Her tears now fell fast, for as she thought, she also listened to the voices of her two youngest children, who were standing over by the window together. Say, Maggie, does yer see that bright star up there? I wonder if that is the star where the shepherd's seen. If it is, it seems to be looking right down at us. Maybe Jesus is in that star, and if he is, he won't forget us, will he? And Tot looked at Maggie, as the latter said. Jesus loved little children, Tot, when he was on the earth, and I guess he loves them yet. That's a very bright star. It must be the one that was seen by the shepherds at Bethlehem. I think so, too, said Tot, and maybe Josie will hear some of them good tidings while she is out. Oh, Maggie, Jesus must love Mother. She is so good, and I think he has sent that star to tell us to look out for good news. And where was Josie all this time? The mother thought she had gone into a neighbor's, where she frequently went, and so felt no anxiety. Out in the streets of the big city, side by side walked plenty and poverty, wealth and wretchedness, happiness and hunger, gladness and grief. Some carried bundles in their arms, while others carried burdens in their hearts. Over all, the good God watched, and down upon all the bright star shone. But what is that? Suddenly on one of the streets the people stopped and listened. On the steps of a stoop leading up to a lighted mansion stood a little girl who looked like a bright angel from heaven. Far above, overhead, shone the bright star that Maggie and Tot had seen. It was their star, and it was her star, for Josie, too, had discovered it, and somehow felt that the star that had brought good tidings of great joy to the shepherds on Bethlehem's plains, had come again, and to bring once more good tidings. She had mounted the steps to get nearer the star, and then all unconscious of the people, in her rich, sweet voice, she sang, I think when I read that sweet story of old, when Jesus was here among men, how he called little children as lambs to his fold, I should like to have been with him then. I wish that his hands had been placed on my head, that his arms had been thrown round me, that I might have seen his kind look when he said, Let the little ones come unto me. As she sang, her gaze was fixed on the star, 
and even her hands were lifted toward it. The people looked at her. An angel had appeared in their midst. Her face, her voice, her upturned eyes, her uplifted hands, held them spellbound, until someone looking up in the direction she pointed cried out, See that star? Heavenward went the gaze of the multitude, and once more there seemed to come to them a voice, saying, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. The face of Josie was illumined, and even the multitude that had gathered failed to alarm her. The star, with its good tidings, was over her head and in her heart as well. Who are you, my child? said a gentleman, who had come up on the steps where she stood. Please, sir, I am Josie Sandford. The gentleman gave a start and said, Sandford? Josie Sandford? Pray, where do you live, Josie? She told him, and in response to other questions, told of mother, brother, and sisters. Oh, sir, do you see the star? I am sure it has some good tidings for us at our house, and I must hurry home and tell mother all about it. Good-bye. Away sped the child, until she reached her home, and then entering the room quietly, she went up to her mother and said, Have you seen the star, mother? Maggie and Tot cried out, We've seen it. Come, mother, and look quick. The mother went quietly to the window, and there beheld a star of wonderful brightness, and as she gazed, her face took on a new light, and into her heart came a great peace. The sleeping boy was awakened by the voices, and he, too, made his way to the window, and looked at the star. At evening time it shall be light. It had come, and something else had come, too, for steps were heard on the stairs, followed by a knock on the door, on opening which in came a company of newsboys headed by Big Tom. They bore bundles and baskets, provisions and poultry, sunshine and sugar, toys and turnips, goodwill and grapes, cheer and celery, and things that no one but those who had lacked for them would ever have thought of. Big Tom was the spokesman for the happy company. "'If you're pleased, Mrs. Sandford,' he said, "'there's our banquet. We wasn't going to come until tomorrow morning, but when we got the things all together, we just couldn't wait any longer, so we brought em to-night. And if it isn't too soon, ma'am, we wishes you and Will and Josie and Maggie and Tot a Merry Christmas, doesn't we, boys? Indeed we does, responded the boys. The faces of that mother and her children were a sight to behold. Smiles and tears greeted the boys, and the mother and her three girls had a kiss for each of them. Then Tot said, I knowed it, I knowed it, the star had Jesus in it and I knowed he see Maggie and me looking up at it. Well, boys, said Mrs. Sandford, you shall have your banquet, for I want you all to take Christmas dinner with us to-morrow. Yes, boys, you shall all take dinner with Mrs. Sandford and her children to-morrow, but it must be at the home of her parents, and not here, said a gentleman who had not been noticed as he stood in the hallway. Mrs. Sanford started as the owner of the voice entered the room, and little Josie sprang toward him at the same moment. She resembled her mother, and was her namesake as well. The gentleman stretched out his arms toward Mrs. Sanford, as he said to her, "'Josie, can you forgive me for the harshness with which I drove you years ago from my door? God only knows how I have suffered.' and for years I have hunted high and low for you, and have advertised time and again, but all was in vain, until to-night I saw your face, and heard your voice once more, as my grandchild, Josie, stood singing on the steps and gazing at the star. In her I found you again, and, oh, 
how your mother and I have prayed for this time to come. Long before he had finished, the daughter was in her father's arms once more, and the children were clinging to their new-found grandparent. The newsboys looked on in wonder, and suddenly little Tot ran to the window, and then cried out, Oh, Grandpa, the star is here yet, and it shines brighter than before. And she threw a kiss up to the star. Christmas morning came, and found them all in a home of plenty. A chair that had long stood vacant at that table was once more filled, and near it were four other chairs for the new-found grandchildren. Was it a Merry Christmas, did you inquire? Just ask those newsboys who came at two o'clock if they ever had such a banquet before or since, or whether they ever saw a home in which the Star of Bethlehem shone with greater splendor. And over the earth the star still shines, and will continue to shine, until all mankind shall yet have a Merry Christmas. End of Section 22 Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 23 of A Budget of Christmas Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tim Watkins. Indian Pete's Christmas Gift. The moon was just peeping over the pines as Peter Shivershe slunk down the road from the lumber camp into the forest. Pete did not present a surpassingly dignified appearance as he skulked through the clearing, but he was not a very dignified person even at his best. Most persons would have said, I think that Pete's method of departure was hardly appropriate for one who had been selected by the citizens of Carter's camp to go on an important mission. But Pete had his own reasons for his actions. He crept along behind the stumps and logs till he reached the forest. Then, as if the shadow gave him fresh courage and dignity, he drew himself upright and started at a sharp trot down the road toward the village. We have said that Pete had reasons for his conduct. They were good ones. In the first place, he was an Indian. Not a noble son of the forest, such as Cooper loved to picture, but a mean, dirty, yellow-faced engine, lazy and worthless, picking up a living about the lumber camps, working as little as he could, and eating and drinking as much as possible. Such was the messenger. The mission was worse yet. It was Christmas Eve. The snow covered the ground, and the ice had stilled for the time the mouth of the roaring river. It was Saturday night as well, and for some time past the lumbermen had been considering the advisability of keeping the good old holiday with some form of celebration suited to the occasion. The citizens of Carter's camp were not remarkably fastidious. They knew but one form of celebration, and they had no thought of hunting out new ones. The one thing needful to make a celebration completely successful was liquor. This they must have in order to do justice to the day. The temperance laws of Carter's were very strict. Not that the moral sentiment of the place was particularly high, but it had been noticed that the amounts of labor and whiskey were in inverse proportions. The more whiskey, the less labor. It was a pure question of political economy. The foreman had often stated that he would prosecute to the fullest extent of the law the first man caught bringing whiskey into camp. The foreman did not attempt, perhaps, to deny that his knowledge of the law was somewhat crude. He had forcibly stated, however, that should a case be brought before him, he would himself act as judge and jury, while his fist and foot would take the place of witness and counsel. There was something so terrible in this statement coming as it did from the largest man in camp, that very little whiskey had thus far been brought in. Christmas had come, and the drinking element in Carter's camp proposed that Pete Shivershe, the engine, be sent to town for a quantity of the liquid poison that the drinkers might enjoy themselves. Bill Gammon found Pete curled up by the stove. He took him out of doors and explained the business in hand. 
Bill prided himself somewhat on his ability to get work out of engines. Pete muttered only, All right. He took the money Bill gave him and then slunked away down the road for the forest, as we have seen him. Bill felt so confident of the success of his experiment that he did not hesitate to inform the boys that Pete was dead sure to return. He would stake his reputation upon it. Pete was in a hard position. If he loved anything in this world, it was whiskey. If there was anything he feared, it was Bill's fist. The two were sure to go together. The money jingling in his pocket suggested unlimited pleasures, but over every one hung Bill's hard fist. He ran several miles through the forest, till turning a corner of the road, he came upon a little clearing, in which stood a small log house. Pete knew the place well. Here lived Jeff Hunt, with his wife, a French woman, and her troop of children. Jeff was a person of little importance by the side of his wife, though, like all lords of creation, he considered himself the legal and proper head of the family, as well as one of the mainstays of society. His part of the family government consisted, for the most part, in keeping the house supplied with wood and water, and in smoking his comfortable pipe in the corner while his wife bent over her tub. Miss Hunt was the only woman near the camp, and so all the laundry work fell to her. Laundry work in the pine woods implies mending and darning, as well as washing and ironing, and the poor little woman had her hands full of work, surely. It was rub, 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 day after day, over the steaming tub, with the children running about like little wolves, and Jeff kindly giving his advice from his comfortable corner. And even after the children were in bed at night, she must set up and mend the clean clothes. What a pack of children there were! How rough and strong they seemed, running about all day, all but poor little Marie, the oldest. She had never been strong, and now at last she was dying of consumption. She could not sit up at all, but lay all day on the little bed in the corner, watching her mother with sad, beautiful eyes. The brave little French woman's heart almost failed her at times, as she saw how, day by day, the little form grew thinner, the eyes more beautiful, the cheeks more flushed. She knew the signs too well, but there was nothing she could do. Pete was a regular visitor at Jeff's and always a welcome one. His work was to carry the washing to and from camp. He came nearer to feeling like a man at Jeff's house than at any other place he knew of. Everyone but Mrs. Hunt and little Marie called him only Injun. But they always said, Mr. Shivershe. The Mr. Shivershe of the little French woman was the nearest claim to respectability that Pete felt able to make. One night while carrying home the clothes, he dropped them in the mud. He never minded the whipping Bill Gammon gave him half as much as he did poor Miss Hunt's tears to think how her work had gone for nothing. As Pete came trotting down the road, Jeff stood in front of his house chopping stove wood from a great log. A lantern hung on a stump, provided light for his purpose. Bill stopped from sheer force of habit in front of the house, and Jeff, glad of any chance to interrupt his work, paused to talk with him. Walk in, Injun said jeff hospitably your clothes ain't quite ready but the woman will have em all up soon walk in it suddenly came over pete that this was his night for taking the clothes home but his present errand was of far more importance than mere laundry work me no stop i'm going to town great work large business by which vague hints he meant no doubt to impress jeff with a sense of the dignity of his mission and yet cunningly to keep its objects concealed go into town be ye great doing ter camp to-morrow i suppose i'll be round if i can get away but walk in injun and get your supper and see the women and jeff opened the door for pete to pass in the thought of supper was too much for Pete, and he slunk in after Jeff and stood in the corner by the door. The room was hardly an inviting one, and yet if Pete had been a white man, some thoughts of home, sweet home, must have passed through his mind, but he was only a despised engine. A rough board table was laid for supper at one side of the room. In the corner, little Marie lay with the firelight falling over her poor, thin face. Pete must have felt, as he looked at her, like some hopeless convict gazing through his prison bars upon some fair saint passing before him. 
she seemed to be in another world than his there seemed between them a gulf that could not be bridged three of the larger children were sobbing in the corner while the rest formed a sorrowful group about an old box in which were two or three simple plants frozen and yellow mrs hunt was frying pork over the hot stove as she looked up at pete he noticed that she had been crying jeff was the very prince of host he made haste to make pete feel at home set by injun so the boys is goin to kind of celebrate tomorrow be they but pete felt that his mission must not be disclosed what matter is we kids he asked to change his subject oh they're just a yellin about them flowers explained jeff you see they have been a training some posies indoors against tomorrow you know tomorrow's christmas you see and them kids they had an idea that have some flowers for to decorate that corner where the little gal is little gals when they ain't well like sech things you know pete nodded he was not aware of this love of diminutive females but it would not show very good breeding to appear ignorant well you see continued jeff they keep the flowers away from the little gal meaning to surprise her like but just this afternoon they get checked by the frost and now there they be stiffen stakes it is kind of bad ain't it especially is it's christmas too what christmas put in pete oh christmas while well, it's sort of a day like it's something like other days and yet it ain't but then injun i don't suppose you would understand if i was to tell you and jeff concealed his own ignorance as many wiser and better men have done by assuming a tone too lofty for his audience but mrs hunt could explain even if jeff could not she paused on the way to the stove with a dish of pork in her hand it is the day of the good lord mr shibashi it is the day when the good lord he was born and when all people should be glad but the little woman belied her own creed as she thought of little marie and the dead flowers i hardly think pete gained a very clear idea of the day even from mrs hunt's explanation it was i fear all greek to him what flowers for he asked as in response to jeff's polite invitation he sat by and began supper while it's sort of idea of the women explained jeff looks kind of pretty to see flowers round you see kind of slicks up a room like all these things here to come into keeping house you see injun with which broad explanation jeff helped himself to a piece of pork but mrs hunt was bound to explain too her explanation was certainly more poetic it is the way we show our love for the good lord mr shibashi what is more beautiful than the flowers we take the flowers and with much love we place them upon the walls and we make others happy with them and the good lord who loves us all he is pleased but here seeing the sobbing children and the frozen plants she could not help wiping her eyes upon her apron the little sufferer on the bed saw this action her voice was almost gone never mind mamma she whispered but the beautiful eyes were filled with tears but she knew that mamma would mind that she could not help it pete listened to all this attentively injun that he was of course he could not understand it all and yet he could hardly help seeing something of the sorrow that the loss of the flowers had brought upon the family he finished his supper and then slunk out at the door again jeff followed him out little gal ever get well asked pete no i don't suppose she will answered jeff there ain't no hopes held out for her makes it kinder bad you see nice clever little gal as ever lived too stop in and get your clothes when you come back will you all right muttered pete as he trotted away toward the town i wonder what pete was thinking about as he ran through the forest an injun's thoughts on any ordinary subject cannot be very deep yet when one comes from such a scene as pete had just witnessed and with such sad eyes as marie's haunt one all along a lonely road even an injun's thoughts must be worth noticing let us imagine what pete's thoughts were as he shuffled mile after mile through the snow the scene he had just left rose before his dull injun mind how kind miss hunt had always been to him 
she was the only one that called him mister how queer it was that the children could cry because the flowers were killed how little marie had looked at him somehow pete could not drive those sad eyes away they seemed to be looking at him from every stump from every tree they were filled with tears now could it be because the flowers were frozen it is no wonder that when at last the few lingering village lights came into view pete was wondering how he could help matters out it was quite late and most of the shops were closed only here and there some late workers showed a light the bar rooms were open full blast and as pete glided down the sawdust street it needed all the remembrance of bill's fist to keep him from parting with a portion of the jingling money for an equal amount of good cheer but the fist had the best of it and he went straight on to the last bar room suddenly bill was right nothing but a miracle could stop him but the miracle was performed and when pete least expected it pete knew better than to go into the front door of the bar room he knew how well he and all his race were protected by the government it had been decided that no one should be allowed to sell liquor to an engine at least at the regular bar if an engine however could so far lose light of his personal dignity as to come sneaking in at the back door and pay an extra price for his liquor whose business was it pete knew the way of bartenders he had been in the business before he did not go in at the front door where the higher-bred white men were made welcome but slunk down an alley by the side of the building meaning to go in the back way there was no light in the store next the bar room it was a milliner's store and had been closed for some hours but in the back room two women were working away anxious to finish a hat evidently intended for some village bale's christmas pete stopped in the dark alley for a moment to watch them a man sat asleep in a chair by the stove but the women worked on with tireless fingers the hat was growing more and more brilliant under their quick touches by their side stood a basket of artificial flowers and bright ribbons it seemed to pete that he had never before seen anything so beautiful here were flowers why could he not get some for the little sick girl it was a severe struggle for the poor engine out there in the dark alley the thought of the thrashing he would receive on the one hand and the sad eyes of marie on the other what could he do but even an engine can remember a kindness it may have been a miracle or it may have been just the outcropping of the desire to repay a kindness whichever an engine is said to possess at any rate the eyes conquered and pete braved the fist of bill but fear that he should lose courage he pushed against the door of the room and entered without ceremony there was a great commotion i can assure you the idea of an engine pushing his way into the back parlor of a milliner's shop was too much of a revolutionary proceeding to pass unnoticed the women dropped their work with a little scream while the men started from their chair with more violent attempt upon poor pete what be ye after here engine he growled hump yourself out of here get a goin but pete pulled out his money at the sight of which the standing army of the milliner's store paused money has smoothed over many an outrage it might perhaps excuse even such an action on the part of an engine i want flowers pete said pointing to the basket give me flowers i pay oh you want to buy some of them artificial flowers do you this is pretty time of night to come flower hunting ain't it just pick out your flowers and then climb out and he held the basket out at arm's length for pete to select pete took a great red rose and a white flower there was not very much of a stock to select from but pete with engine instinct selected the largest and gaudiest them is worth about ten shillings figured up the merchant taking the money from pete's hand pete carefully placed the flowers in the pocket of his ragged coat and started for the door the milliner's man rendered affable by the most surprising bargain he had just made naturally wished to retain the patronage of such a model customer won't anything in our line engine just call round and we'll please you only come a little afore bedtime when you come again but pete slunk out at the door and did not hear him pete's money was nearly gone but he had a scheme in his head he slunk in at the back door of the bar room and obtained his jug and what whiskey he could buy with the rest of his money then up the street he ran again out of town stopping only once at the pump to fill the jug to the top with water 
resolutely fastening in the stopper and not even raising the jug to his mouth he started for camp at his long swinging trot with the jug in his hand mile after mile was passed over and pete did not stop till jeff hunt's cabin came in sight hiding his jug behind a log he crept up to the window and looked in the light was burning on the table while miss hunt sat nodding over her work she had been mending the clothes so that pete could take them back with him tired out she had fallen asleep the box of frozen plants still stood by the table pete grinned as he saw them thinking of the great flowers in his pocket marie was asleep over her head were huge long clusters of moss with masses of ground pine and red berries pete stole to the door and went in miss hunt woke with a start but at sight of pete smiled in her weary way pete made up his bundle of clothes and then pulled out the great red rose and the white flower he laid them on the table with flowers for little gal sick make her think christmas good flowers all color no fade no smell no wear out then catching up his bundle he slunk away without waiting for mrs hunt's thanks when bill gammon woke in the morning he found the jug at the foot of his bunk but pete was nowhere to be seen he had left the jug and fled the christmas celebration at carter's was a very tame affair many were the curses showered upon pete and had that worthy been present i doubt if even the thoughts of the famous miracle would have sustained him in the beating he would have received but if pete's conduct produced such a sad effect upon the festivities at carter's the joy is caused at jeff hunt's cabin made matters even the glad christmas sun glad with the promise of the old old story came dancing and sparkling over the trees and looked down in wonderful tenderness upon the humble cabin the first bright beams fell upon the bed where little marie was lying they showed her the rose and the white flower nestling in the evergreens the children came and stood in wonder before the rude flowers how wonderful they were where could they have come from the face of the little girl was more patient than before the eyes seemed more tender and yet not so sad perhaps the glad sun the same good sun that had looked upon that far-away tomb from which the stone had rolled whispered to her as it played about her face how soon the stone would roll from her life how soon she would forget all her care and trouble and enter the land of sunshine and flowers it may be that the good old christmas sun even hunted out poor despised pete and told him something of his happiness i am sure he deserved it let us hope so at any rate end of section twenty three recording by tim watkins Section 24 of A Budget of Christmas Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. My Christmas Dinner. It was on the 20th of December last that I received an invitation from my friend, Mr. Figgins, to dine with him in Mark Lane on Christmas Day. I had several reasons for declining this proposition. The first was that Mr. P. makes it a rule at all these festivals to empty the entire contents of his counting-house into his little dining parlor, and you consequently sit down to dinner with six white waistcoated clerks let loose upon a turkey. The second was that I am not sufficiently well read in cotton and sugar to enter with any spirit into the subject of conversation and the third was and is that i never drink cape wine but by far the most prevailing reason remains to be told i had been anticipating for some days and was hourly in the hope of receiving an invitation to spend my christmas day in a most irresistible quarter the felicity of eating plum pudding with an angel and on the strength of my imaginary engagement i returned a polite note to mr p reducing him to the necessity of advertising for another candidate for cape and turkey the twenty-first came another invitation to dine with a regiment of roast beef eaters at clapham i declined this also for the above reason and for one other viz that on dining there ten christmas days ago 
it was discovered on sitting down that one little accompaniment of the roast beef had been entirely overlooked would it be believed but i will not stay to mystify i merely mention the fact they had forgotten the horseradish the next day arrived and with it a neat epistle sealed with violet-coloured wax from upper brook street dine with the ladies at home on christmas day very tempting it is true but not exactly the letter i was longing for i began however to debate within myself upon the policy of securing this bird in hand instead of waiting for the two that were still hopping about the bush when the consultation was suddenly brought to a close by a prophetic view of the portfolio of drawings fresh from boarding school moths and roses on embossed paper to say nothing of the album in which i stood engaged to write an elegy on a java sparrow that had been the favourite in the family for three days i rung for gilt-edged pleaded a world of polite regret and again declined the twenty-third dawned time was getting on rather rapidly but no card came i began to despair of any more invitations and to repent of my refusals breakfast was hardly over however when the servant brought up not a letter but an aunt and a brace of cousins from bayswater they would listen to no excuse consanguinity required me and christmas was not my own now my cousins kept no albums they are really as pretty as cousins can be and when violent hands with white kid gloves are laid on one it is sometimes difficult to effect an escape with becoming elegance i could not however give up my darling hope of a pleasanter prospect they fought with me in fifty engagements that i pretended to have made i showed them the court guide with ten names obliterated being those of persons who had not asked me to mincemeat and mistletoe and i ultimately gained my cause by quartering the remains of an infectious fever on the sensitive fears of my aunt and by dividing a rheumatism and a sprained ankle between my sympathetic cousins as soon as they were gone i walked out sauntering involuntarily in the direction of the only house in which i felt i could spend a happy christmas as i approached a porter brought a large hamper to the door a present from the country thought i yes they do dine at home they must ask me they know that i am in town immediately afterward a servant issued with a letter he took the nearest way to my lodgings and i hurried back by another street to receive the so much wished for invitation i was in a state of delirious delight i arrived but there was no letter i sat down to wait in a spirit of calmer enjoyment than i had experienced for some days and in less than half an hour a note was brought to me at length the desired dispatch had come it seemed written on the leaf of a lily with a pen dipped in dew i opened it and had nearly fainted with disappointment it was from a stockbroker who begins an anecdote of mr rothschild before dinner and finishes it with the fourth bottle and who makes his eight children stay up to supper and snapdragon in macadamizing a stray stone in one of his periodical puddings i once lost a tooth and with it an heiress of some reputation i wrote a most irritable apology and dispatched my warmest regards in a whirlwind december the twenty fourth i began to count the hours and uttered many poetical things about the wings of time alack no letter came yes i received a note from a distinguished dramatist requesting the honour etc but i was too cunning for this and practised wisdom for once i happened to reflect that his pantomime was to make its appearance on the night after and that his object was to perpetrate the whole programme upon me regret that i could not have the pleasure of meeting mr paolo and the rest of the literati to be then and there assembled was of course immediately expressed my mind became restless and agitated i felt amidst all these invitations cruelly neglected they served indeed but to increase my uneasiness as they opened prospects of happiness in which i could take no share they discovered a most tempting dessert composed of forbidden fruit i took down child harold and read myself into a sublime contempt of mankind i began to perceive that merriment is only malice in disguise and that the chief cardinal virtue 
is misanthropy i sat nursing my wrath till it scorched me when the arrival of another epistle suddenly charmed me from this state of delicious melancholy and delightful endurance of wrong i sickened as i surveyed and trembled as i opened it it was dated blank but no matter it was not the letter in such a frenzy as mine raging to behold the object of my admiration condescend not to eat a custard but to render it invisible to be invited perhaps to a tart fabricated by her own ethereal fingers with such possibilities before me how could i think of joining a friendly party where i should inevitably sit next to a deaf lady who had been when a little girl patted on the head by wilkes or my lord north she could not recollect which had taken tea with the author of junius but had forgotten his name and who once asked me whether mr munden's monument was in westminster abbey or st paul's i seized a pen and presented my compliments i hesitated for the peril of precariousness of my situation flashed on my mind but hope had still left me a straw to catch at and i at length succeeded in resisting this late and terrible temptation after the first burst of excitement i sunk into still deeper despondency my spirit became a prey to anxiety and remorse i could not eat dinner was removed with unlifted covers i went out the world seemed to have acquired a new face nothing was to be seen but raisins and rounds of beef i wandered about like lear i had given up all i felt myself graded against the world like a nutmeg it grew dark i sustained a still gloomier shock every chance seemed to have expired and everybody seemed to have a delightful engagement for the next day i alone was disengaged i felt like the last man to-morrow appeared to have already commenced its career mankind had anticipated the future and coming mince pies cast their shadows before in this state of desolation and dismay i called i could not help it at the house to which i had so fondly anticipated an invitation and a welcome my protest must here however be recorded that though i called in the hope of being asked it was my fixed determination not to avail myself of so protracted a piece of politeness no my triumph would have been to have annihilated them with an engagement made in september payable three months after date with these feelings i gave an agitated knock they were stoning the plums and did not immediately attend i rung how unlike a dinner bell it sounded a girl at length made her appearance and with a mouthful of citron informed me that the family had gone to spend their christmas eve in portland place i rushed down the steps i hardly knew whither my first impulse was to go to some wharf and inquire what vessels were starting for america but it was a cold night i went home and threw myself on my miserable couch in other words i went to bed i dozed and dreamed away the hours till daybreak sometimes i fancied myself seated in a roaring circle roasting chestnuts at a blazing log at others that i had fallen into the serpentine while skating and that the humane society was piling upon me a pelion or rather a vesuvius of blankets i awoke a little refreshed alas it was the twenty-fifth of the month it was christmas day let the reader if he possess the imagination of milton conceive my sensations i swallowed an atom of dry toast nothing could calm the fever of my soul i stirred the fire and read zimmerman alternately even reason the last remedy one has recourse to in such cases came at length to my relief i argued myself into a philosophic fit but unluckily just as the lethean tide within me was at its height my landlady broke in upon my lethargy and chased away by a single word all the little sprites and pleasures that were acting as my physicians and prescribing balm for my wounds she paid me the usual compliment and then do you dine at home to-day sir abruptly inquired she here was a question no spanish inquisitor ever inflicted such complete dismay in so short a sentence had she given me a sphinx to expound a gordian tangle to untwist had she set me a lesson in algebra or asked me the way to brobdingnag had she desired me to show her the north pole 
or the meaning of a melodrama any or all of these i might have accomplished but to request me to define my dinner to inquire into its latitude to compel me to fathom that sea of appetite which i now felt rushing through my frame to ask me to dive into futurity and become the prophet of pies and preserves my heart died within me at the impossibility of a reply she had repeated the question before i could collect my senses around me then for the first time it occurred to me that in the event of my having no engagement abroad my landlady meant to invite me there will at least be the two daughters i whispered to myself and after all lucy matthews is a charming girl and touches the harp divinely she has a very small pretty hand i recollect only her fingers are so punctured by the needle and i rather think she bites her nails no i will not even now give up my hope it was yesterday but a straw to-day it is but the thistle-down but i will cling to it to the last moment there are still four hours left they will not dine till six one desperate struggle and the peril is past let me not be seduced by this last golden apple and i may yet win my race the struggle was made i should not dine at home this was the only phrase left me for i could not say that i should dine out alas that an event should be at the same time so doubtful and so desirable i only begged that if any letter arrived it might be brought to me immediately the last plank the last splinter had now given way beneath me i was floating about with no hope but the chance of something almost impossible they had left me alone not with my glory but with an appetite that resembled an avalanche seeking whom it might devour i had passed one dinnerless day and half of another yet the promised land was as far from sight as ever i recounted the chances i had missed the dinners i might have enjoyed passed in a dioramic view before my eyes mr figgins and his six clerks the clapham beef-eaters the charms of upper brook street my pretty cousins and the pantomime writer the stockbroker whose stories one forgets and the elderly lady who forgets her stories they all marched by me a procession of apparitions even my landlady's invitation though unborn was not forgotten in summing up my sacrifices and for what four o'clock hope was perfectly ridiculous i had been walking upon the hair bridge over a gulf and could not get into elysium after all i had been catching moonbeams and running after notes of music despair was my only convenient refuge no chance remained unless something should drop from the clouds in this last particular i was not disappointed for on looking up i perceived a heavy shower of snow yet i was obliged to venture forth for being supposed to dine out i could not of course remain at home where to go i knew not i was like my first father the world was all before me i flung my coat round me and hurried forth with the feelings of abandon longing for a stiletto at the foot of the stairs i staggered against two or three smiling rascals priding themselves upon their punctuality they had just arrived to make the tour of turkey how i hated them as i rushed by the parlor a single glance disclosed to me a blazing fire with lucy and several lovely creatures in a semicircle fancy too gave me a glimpse of a sprig of mistletoe i vanished from the house like a spectre at daybreak how long i wandered about is doubtful at last i happened to look through a kitchen window with an area in front and saw a villain with a fork in his hand throwing himself back in his chair choked with ecstasy another was feasting with a graver air he seemed to be swallowing a bit of paradise and criticizing its flavor this was too much for mortality my appetite fastened upon me like an alligator i darted from the spot and only a few yards further discerned a house with rather an elegant exterior and with some ham in the window that looked perfectly sublime there was no time for consideration to hesitate was to perish i entered it was indeed a banquet hall deserted the very waiters had gone home to their friends there however i found a fire and there to sum up all my folly and felicity in a single word i dined End of section 24
section twenty five of a budget of christmas tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen the poor traveller by charles dickens dickens's introduction to this story describes his going to rochester on christmas eve and seeing there a quaint old charity which provided for the entertainment of six poor travellers who not being rogues or proctors might receive gratis for one night lodging entertainment and four pence each in honour of the day a special meal is provided for the travellers then in the charity after the meal when the travellers have gathered around the fire their entertainer gives them the reason for the unwanted feast as christmas eve my friends when the shepherds who were poor travellers too in their way heard the angels sing on earth peace good will toward men then each traveller was invited to relate a story and among those told was the following in the year one thousand seven hundred and ninety nine a relative of mine came limping down on foot to the town of chatham he was a poor traveller with not a farthing in his pocket my relative came down to chatham to enlist in a cavalry regiment if a cavalry regiment would have him if not to take king george's shilling from any corporal or sergeant who would put a bunch of ribbons in his hat his object was to get shot but he thought he might as well ride to death as be at the trouble of walking my relative's christian name was richard but he was better known as dick he dropped his own surname on the road down and took up that of double dick he was passed as richard double dick age twenty-two height five foot ten native place exmouth which he had never been near in his life there was no cavalry in chatham when he limped over the bridge with half a shoe to his dusty feet so he enlisted into a regiment of the line and was glad to get drunk and forget all about it you are to know that this relative of mine had gone wrong and run wild his heart was in the right place but it was sealed up he had been betrothed to a good and beautiful girl whom he had loved better than she or perhaps even he believed but in an evil hour he had given her cause to say to him solemnly richard i will never marry any other man i will live single for your sake but mary marshall's lips her name was mary marshall never address another word to you on earth go richard heaven forgive you this finished him this brought him down to chatham this made him private richard doubledick with a determination to be shot there was not a more dissipated and reckless soldier in chatham barracks in the year one thousand seven hundred and ninety nine than private richard doubledick he associated with the dregs of every regiment he was as seldom sober as he could be and was constantly under punishment it became clear to the whole barracks that private richard doubledick would very soon be flogged now the captain of richard doubledick's company was a young gentleman not above five years his senior whose eyes had an expression in them which affected richard doubledick in a very remarkable way they were bright handsome dark eyes what are called laughing eyes generally and when serious rather steady than severe but they were the only eyes now left in his narrow world that private richard doubledick could not stand unabashed by evil report and punishment defiant of everything else and everybody else he had but to know that those eyes looked at him for a moment and he felt ashamed he could not so much as salute captain Towton in the street like any other officer he was reproached and confused troubled by the mere possibility of the captain's looking at him in his worst moments he would rather turn back and go any distance out of his way than encounter those two handsome dark bright eyes one day when private richard doubledick came out of the black hole where he had been passing the last eight and forty hours and in which retreat he spent a good deal of his time he was ordered to betake himself to captain Towton's quarters in the stale and squalid state of a man just out of the black hole he had less fancy than ever for being seen by the captain but he was not so mad yet as to disobey orders 
and consequently went up to the terrace overlooking the parade ground where the officers quarters were twisting and breaking in his hands as he went along a bit of the straw that had formed the decorative furniture of the black hole come in cried the captain when he knocked with his knuckles at the door private richard doubledick pulled off his cap took a stride forward and felt very conscious that he stood in the light of the dark bright eyes there was a slight pause private richard doubledick had put the straw in his mouth and was gradually doubling it up into his windpipe and choking himself doubledick said the captain do you know where you are going to to the devil sir faltered doubledick yes returned the captain and very fast private richard doubledick turned the straw of the black hole in his mouth and made a miserable salute of acquiescence double dick said the captain since i entered his majesty's service a boy of seventeen i have been pained to see many men of promise going that road but i have never been so pained to see a man determined to make the shameful journey as i have been ever since you joined the regiment to see you private richard doubledick began to find a film stealing over the floor at which he looked also to find the legs of the captain's breakfast-table turning crooked as if he saw them through water i am only a common soldier sir said he it signifies very little what such a poor brute comes to you are a man returned the captain with grave indignation of education and superior advantages and if you say that meaning what you say you have sunk lower than i had believed how low that must be i leave you to consider knowing what i know of your disgrace and seeing what i see i hope to get shot soon sir said private richard doubledick and then the regiment and the world together will be rid of me the legs of the table were becoming very crooked doubledick looking up to steady his vision met the eyes that had so strong an influence over him he put his hand before his own eyes and the breast of his disgraced jacket swelled as if it would fly asunder i would rather said the young captain see this in you double dick than i would see five thousand guineas counted out upon this table for a gift to my good mother have you a mother i am thankful to say she is dead sir if your praises returned the captain were sounded from mouth to mouth through the whole regiment through the whole army through the whole country you would wish she had lived to say with pride and joy he is my son spare me sir said double dick she would never have heard any good of me she would never have had any pride and joy in owning herself my mother and would have always had i know but not spare me sir i am a broken wretch quite at your mercy and he turned his face to the wall and stretched out his imploring hand my friend began the captain god bless you sir sobbed private richard doubledick i have heard from private richard doubledick's own lips that he dropped down upon his knee kissed that officer's hand arose and went out of the light of the dark bright eyes an altered man in that year one thousand seven hundred and ninety nine the french were in egypt in italy in germany where not napoleon bonaparte had likewise begun to stir against england in india and most men could read the signs of the great troubles that were coming on in the very next year when we formed an alliance with austria against him captain taunton's regiment was on service in india and there was not a finer non-commissioned officer in it no nor in the whole line than corporal richard doubledick in eighteen hundred and one the indian army were on the coast of egypt next year was the year of the proclamation of the short peace and they were recalled it had then become well known to thousands of men that wherever captain taunton with the dark bright eyes led there close to him ever at his side firm as a rock true as the sun and brave as mars would be certain to be found while life beat in their hearts that famous soldier sergeant richard doubledick eighteen hundred and five besides being the great year of trafalgar was a year of hard fighting in india that year saw such wonders done by a sergeant major who cut his way single-handed through a solid mass of men recovered the colors of his regiment which had been seized from the hand of a poor boy shot through the heart and rescued his wounded captain who was down and in a very jungle of horses hoofs and sabres saw such wonders done i say by this brave sergeant-major that he was specially made the bearer of the colors he had won 
and ensign richard doubledick had risen from the ranks sorely cut up in every battle but always reinforced by the bravest of men for the fame of following the old colours shot through and through which ensign richard doubledick had saved inspired all breasts this regiment fought its way through the peninsular war up to the investment of badajos in eighteen hundred and twelve again and again it had been cheered through the british ranks until the tears had sprung into men's eyes at the mere hearing of the mighty british voice so exultant in their valour and there was not a drummer boy but knew the legend that wherever the two friends major Towton, with the dark bright eyes and ensign richard doubledick who was devoted to him were seen to go there the boldest spirits in the english army became wild to follow one day at badajos not in the great storming but in repelling a hot sally of the besieged upon our men at work in the trenches who had given way the two officers found themselves hurrying forward face to face against a party of french infantry who made a stand there was an officer at their head encouraging his men a courageous handsome gallant officer of five and thirty whom double dick saw hurriedly almost momentarily but saw well he particularly noticed this officer waving his sword and rallying his men with an eager and excited cry when they fired in obedience to his gesture and major taunton dropped it was over in ten minutes more and double dick returned to the spot where he had laid the best friend man ever had on a coat spread upon the wet clay major taunton's uniform was open at the breast and on his shirt were three little spots of blood dear double dick said he i am dying for the love of heaven no exclaimed the other kneeling down beside him and passing his arm round his neck to raise his head taunton my preserver my guardian angel my witness dearest truest kindest of human beings taunton for god's sake the bright dark eyes so very very dark now in the pale face smiled upon him and the hand he had kissed thirteen years ago laid itself fondly on his breast write to my mother you will see home again tell her how we became friends it will comfort her as it comforts me he spoke no more but faintly signed for a moment toward his hair as it fluttered in the wind the ensign understood him he smiled again when he saw that and gently turning his face over on the supporting arm as if for rest died with his hand upon the breast in which he had revived a soul no dry eye looked on ensign richard doubledick that melancholy day he buried his friend on the field and became a lone bereaved man beyond his duty he appeared to have but two remaining cares in life one to preserve the little packet of hair he was to give Towton's mother and the other to encounter that french officer who had rallied the men under whose fire Towton fell a new legend now began to circulate among our troops and it was that when he and the french officer came face to face once more there would be weeping in france the war went on and through it went the exact picture of the french officer on the one side and the bodily reality upon the other until the battle of toulouse was fought in the return sent home appeared these words severely wounded but not dangerously lieutenant richard doubledick at midsummer time in the year eighteen hundred and fourteen lieutenant richard doubledick now a browned soldier seven and thirty years of age came home to england invalided he brought the hair with him near his heart many a french officer had he seen since that day many a dreadful night in searching with men and lanterns for his wounded had he relieved french officers lying disabled but the mental picture and the reality had never come together though he was weak and suffered pain he lost not an hour in getting down to Froom in somersetshire where taunton's mother lived and the sweet compassionate words that naturally present themselves to the mind to-night he was the only son of his mother and she was a widow it was on a sunday evening and the lady sat at her quiet garden window reading the bible reading to herself in a trembling voice that very passage in it as i have heard tell him he heard the words young man i say unto thee arise he had to pass the window and the bright dark eyes of his debased time seemed to look at him her heart told her who he was she came to the door quickly and fell upon his neck he saved me from ruin made me a human creature won me from infamy and shame o oh god for ever bless him as he will as he will he will the lady answered i know he is in heaven 
then she piteously cried but oh my darling boy my darling boy never from the hour when private richard doubledick enlisted at chatham and the private corporal sergeant sergeant major ensign or lieutenant breathed his right name or the name of mary marshall or a word of the story of his life into any ear except his reclaimers that previous scene in his existence was closed he had firmly resolved that his expiation should be to live unknown to disturb no more the peace that had long grown over his old offences to let it be revealed when he was dead that he had striven and suffered and had never forgotten and then if they could forgive him and believe him well it would be time enough time enough but that night remembering the words he had cherished for two years tell her how we became friends it will comfort her as it comforts me he related everything it gradually seemed to him as if in his maturity he had recovered a mother it gradually seemed to her as if in her bereavement she had found a son during his stay in england the quiet garden into which he had slowly and painfully crept a stranger became the boundary of his home when he was able to rejoin his regiment in the spring he left the garden thinking was this indeed the first time he had ever turned his face toward the old colors with a woman's blessing he followed them so ragged so scarred and pierced now that they would scarcely hold together to quatre bras and ligny he stood beside them in an awful stillness of many men shadowy through the mist and drizzle of a wet june forenoon on the field of waterloo and down to that hour the picture in his mind of the french officer had never been compared with the reality the famous regiment was in action early in the battle and received its first check in many an eventful year when he was seen to fall but it swept on to avenge him and left behind it no such creature in the world of consciousness as lieutenant richard doubledick through pits of mire and pools of rain along deep ditches once roads that were pounded and ploughed to pieces by artillery heavy wagons tramp of men and horses and the struggle of every wheeled thing that could carry wounded soldiers jolted among the dying and the dead so disfigured by blood and mud as to be hardly recognizable for humanity dead as to any sentient life that was in it and yet alive the form that had been lieutenant richard doubledick with whose praises england rang was conveyed to brussels there it was tenderly laid down in hospital and there it lay week after week through the long bright summer days until the harvest spared by war had ripened and was gathered in slowly laboring at last through a long heavy dream of confused time and place presenting faint glimpses of army surgeons whom he knew and of faces that had been familiar to his youth dearest and kindness among them mary marshall's with a solicitude upon it more like reality than anything he could discern lieutenant richard doubledick came back to life to the beautiful life of a calm autumn evening sunset to the peaceful life of a fresh quiet room with a large window standing open a balcony beyond in which were moving leaves and sweet-smelling flowers beyond again the clear sky with the sun full in his sight pouring its golden radiance on his bed it was so tranquil and so lovely that he thought he had passed into another world and he said in a faint voice taunton are you near me a face bent over him not his his mother's i came to nurse you we have nursed you many weeks you were moved here long ago do you remember nothing nothing the lady kissed his cheek and held his hand soothing him where is the regiment what has happened let me call you mother what has happened mother a great victory dear the war is over and the regiment was the bravest in the field his eyes kindled his lips trembled he sobbed and the tears ran down his face he was very weak too weak to move his hand from that time he recovered slowly for he had been desperately wounded in the head and had been shot in the body but making some little advance every day when he had gained sufficient strength to converse as he lay in bed he soon began to remark that mrs taunton always brought him back to his own history then he recalled his preserver's dying words and thought it comforts her one day he awoke out of a sleep refreshed and asked her to read to him but the curtain of the bed softening the light which she always drew back when he awoke that she might see him from her table at the bedside where she sat at work was held undrawn and a woman's voice spoke which was not hers can you bear to see a stranger it said softly will you like to see a stranger stranger he repeated the voice awoke old memories 
before the days of private richard doubledick a stranger now but not a stranger once it said in tones that thrilled him richard dear richard lost through so many years my name he cried out her name mary and she held him in her arms and his head lay on her bosom well they were happy it was a long recovery but they were happy through it all the snow had melted on the ground and the birds were singing in the leafless thickets of the early spring when those three were first able to ride out together and when people flocked about the open carriage to cheer and congratulate captain richard doubledick but even then it became necessary for the captain instead of returning to england to complete his recovery in the climate of southern france they found a spot upon the rhone within a ride of the old town of avignon and within view of its broken bridge which was all they could desire they lived there together six months then returned to england mrs taunton growing old after three years though not so old as that her bright dark eyes were dimmed and remembering that her strength had been benefited by the change resolved to go back for a year to those parts so she went with the faithful servant who had often carried her son in his arms and she was to be rejoined and escorted home at the year's end by captain richard doubledick she wrote regularly to her children as she called them now and they to her she went to the neighbourhood of x and there in their own chateau near the farmer's house she rented she grew into intimacy with a family belonging to that part of france the intimacy began in her often meeting among the vineyards a pretty child a girl with a most compassionate heart who was never tired of listening to the solitary english lady's stories of her poor son and the cruel wars the family were as gentle as the child and at length she came to know them so well that she accepted their invitation to pass the last month of her residence abroad under their roof all this intelligence she wrote home piecemeal as it came about from time to time and at last enclosed a polite note from the head of the chateau soliciting on the occasion of his approaching mission to that neighbourhood the honour of the company of that man so justly celebrated captain richard doubledick captain doubledick now a hearty handsome man in the full vigour of life broader across the chest and shoulders than he had ever been before dispatched a courteous reply and followed it in person travelling through all that extent of country after three years of peace he blessed the better days on which the world had fallen the corn was golden not drenched in unnatural red was bound in sheaves for food not trodden under foot by men in mortal fight the smoke rose up from the peaceful hearths not blazing ruins the carts were laden with the fair fruits of the earth not with wounds and death to him who had so often seen the terrible reverse these things were beautiful indeed and they brought him in a softened spirit to the old chateau near aix upon a deep blue evening it was a large chateau of the genuine old ghostly kind with round towers and extinguishers and a high leaden roof and more windows than aladdin's palace the entrance doors stood open as doors often do in that country when the heat of the day is past and the captain saw no bell or knocker and walked in he walked into a lofty stone hall refreshingly cool and gloomy after the glare of a southern day's travel extending along the four sides of this hall was a gallery leading to suites of rooms and it was lighted from the top still no bell was to be seen faith said the captain halting ashamed of the clanking of his boots this is a ghostly beginning he started back and felt his face turn white in the gallery looking down at him stood the french officer the officer whose picture he had carried in his mind so long and so far compared with the original at last in every lineament how like it was he moved and disappeared and captain richard doubledick heard his steps coming quickly down into the hall he entered through an archway there was a bright sudden look upon his face much such a look as it had worn in that fatal moment monsieur le capitaine richard doubledick enchanted to receive him he has not remembered me as i have remembered him he did not take such a note of my face that day as i took of his thought captain richard doubledick how shall i tell him you were at waterloo said the french officer i was said captain richard doubledick and at Batichos. left alone with the sound of his own stern voice in his ears he sat down to consider what shall i do and how shall i tell him at that time unhappily 
many deplorable duels had been fought between english and french officers arising out of the recent war and these duels and how to avoid this officer's hospitality were the uppermost thought in captain richard doubledick's mind his mother above all the captain thought how shall i tell her spirit of my departed friend said he is it through thee these better thoughts are rising in my mind is it thou who hast shown me all the way i have drawn to meet this man the blessings of the altered time is it thou who hast sent thy stricken mother to me to stay my angry hand is it from thee the whisper comes that this man did his duty as thou didst and as i did through thy guidance which has wholly saved me here on earth and that he did no more he sat down with his head buried in his hands and when he rose up made the second strong resolution in his life that neither to the french officer nor to the mother of his departed friend nor to any soul while either of the two was living would he breathe what only he knew and when he touched that french officer's glass with his own that day at dinner he secretly forgave him in the name of the divine forgiver of injuries End of The Poor Traveler Section 26 of A Budget of Christmas Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Legend of the Christmas Tree most children have seen a christmas tree and many know that the pretty and pleasant custom of hanging gifts on its boughs comes from germany but perhaps few have heard or read the story that is told to little german children respecting the origin of this custom the story is called the little stranger and runs thus in a small cottage on the borders of a forest lived a poor laborer who gained a scanty living by cutting wood he had a wife and two children who helped him in his work the boy's name was valentine and the girl was called mary they were obedient good children and a great comfort to their parents one winter evening this happy little family were sitting quietly round the hearth the snow and the wind raging outside while they ate their supper of dry bread when a gentle tap was heard on the window and a childish voice cried from without oh let me in pray i am a poor little child with nothing to eat and no home to go to and i shall die of cold and hunger unless you let me in valentine and mary jumped up from the table and ran to open the door saying come in poor little child we have not much to give you but whatever we have we will share with you the stranger child came in and warmed his frozen hands and feet at the fire and the children gave him the best they had to eat saying you must be tired too poor child lie down on our bed we can sleep on the bench for one night then said the little stranger child thank god for all your kindness to me so they took their little guest into their sleeping room laid him on the bed covered him over and said to each other how thankful we ought to be we have warm rooms and a cosy bed while this poor child has only heaven for his roof and the cold earth for his sleeping place when their father and mother went to bed mary and valentine lay quite contentedly on the bench near the fire saying before they fell asleep the stranger child will be so happy to-night in his warm bed these kind children had not slept many hours before mary awoke and softly whispered to her brother valentine dear wake and listen to the sweet music under the window then valentine rubbed his eyes and listened it was sweet music indeed and sounded like beautiful voices singing to the tones of a harp o holy child we greet thee bringing sweet strains of harp to aid our singing thou holy child in peace art sleeping while we our watch without are keeping blessed be the house wherein thou liest happiest on earth to heaven the highest the children listened while a solemn joy filled their hearts then they stepped softly to the window to see who might be without in the east was a streak of rosy dawn and in its light they saw a group of children standing before the house clothed in silver garments holding golden harps in their hands amazed at this sight 
the children were still gazing out of the window when a light tap caused them to turn round there stood the stranger child before them clad in a golden dress with a gleaming radiance round his curling hair i am the little christ child he said who wanders through the world bringing peace and happiness to good children you took me in and cared for me when you thought me a poor child and now you shall have my blessing for what you have done a fir tree grew near the house and from this he broke a twig which he planted in the ground saying this twig shall become a tree and shall bring forth fruit year by year for you no sooner had he done this than he vanished and with him the little choir of angels but the fir branch grew and became a christmas tree and on its branches hung golden apples and silver nuts every christmas tide such is the story told to german children concerning their beautiful christmas trees though we know that the real little christ child can never be wandering cold and homeless again in our world inasmuch as he is safe in heaven by his father's side yet we may gather from this story the same truth which the bible plainly tells us that any one who helps a christian child in distress it will be counted unto him as if he had indeed done it unto christ himself inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these my brethren ye have done it unto me end of section twenty six